Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here live in San Francisco, California. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE's CUBE coverage of AWS Summit 2022 here in San Francisco where all the developers are. It's the Bay Area, at Silicon Valley, and of course, AWS Summit in New York City is coming up in the summer. We'll be there as well. SF and NYC, CUBE coverage, look for us. Of course, Reinforce in Boston and Remars with the whole robotics, AI thing all coming together. Lots of coverage, stay with us. Today we've got a great guest from Decibel VC, John Sakota, founding partner, entrepreneurial venture, is a venture firm, your next act. Welcome to theCUBE, good to see you. Good to see you, Matt. I feel like it's been forever since we've been able to do something in person. Well, I'm glad you're here because we run into each other all the time. We've known each other for over a decade. Um, it's been at least 10 years. At least 10 more. years more. And we don't want to actually go back because then it brings back uh, the old school Web 1.0 days. But anyway, we're in Web 3 now, so we'll get to that we in a are, second. We are. It's a little bit of a throwback to the past, though, in my opinion. <laughs> it's all the same. It's all distributed computing <laughs> and software. We ran each other at KubeCon. You're investing in a lot of tech startup founders. Okay, this next level, next gen entrepreneurs have a new makeup. And it's software, it's hardcore tech. In some cases, not hardcore tech, but using software to take an old, something old and make it better new, faster. So tell us about Decibel, what's the firm? I know you're the founder, uh, which is cool. What's going on? Explain yeah, what you're doing. Uh, I mean, you remember I'm a recovering entrepreneur, right? <laughs> of so course. I, 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 no, you're never recovering, you're always an I'll, entrepreneur. I'll, always, but we are also always <laughs> recovering. So I um, started my first company when I was 24. If you remember, before there was Facebook and friends, there was instant messaging. People were using that product at work every day. They were creating a security vulnerability between their network and the outside world. So I plugged that hole and built an instant messaging firewall. It was my first company. The company was called I Am Logic, and we were acquired by Symantec. Uh, then spent 12 years investing in the next generation of software companies, uh, early investor in open source companies and cloud companies, and spent a really wonderful 12 years uh, at a firm called NEA. So I, I feel like my whole life I've been either starting enterprise software companies yeah, yeah. or helping founders start enterprise software yeah. companies. And I'll tell you, there's never been a better time than right now to yeah, start an enterprise yeah. software company. So uh, the passion for starting a new firm was really a recognition that founders today that are starting an enterprise software company, they, they tend to be, as you said, a more technical founder, right? Usually it's a software engineer or a builder. Uh, they are building products that are serving a slightly different market than what we've traditionally seen in enterprise software, right? I think traditionally we've seen IT buyers or CIOs that have agendas and strategies which you know, purchase software that is traditionally bought and sold tops yeah. down, but you know, today I think the most successful enterprise software companies are the ones that are built more bottoms up and have more technical early adopters and yeah. generally speaking they're free to use, they're free to try, they're very commonly community so source or open yeah. source companies where you have a large technical community that's supporting them. So there's, a, there's kind of a new normal now, I think, yeah. in great enterprise software, and it starts with great technical founders with great products and great bottoms of motions, yeah. and I think there's no better place to uh, service those people than in the cloud and uh, in, in your community. Well, first of all, congratulations, and by the way, you got a great pedigree and great background, you're super smart, I'm an admirer of your work and your, and, and your founding, but let's face it, enterprise is hot because digital transformation is all companies. There's no, I mean, consumer is enterprise now. Everything is what was once a niche, no, I won't say niche category, but you know, not for the faint of heart. You know, investors. You know, it's so funny that you say that enterprise is hot because it, you and I feel that way now. <laughs> but remember, like right now, there's also a giant tech and VC conference in Miami, <laughs> and it's covering cryptocurrencies and NFTs and Web3, so I think beauty is definitely in the eye of the beholder. But no, I, I will tell well, you- NFTs is one big enterprise because you got to have immutability, you got performance issues, you have I, IOPS issues. Well, I mean, and, I, and I think all of us here that are uh, may, maybe students of history and have been involved in open source in the cloud would say that we're, we're you know, much of what we're doing is are the predecessors of the yeah, Web3 yeah. Web movement, and many of us, I think, are contributors to the Web3 movement. All right, movement. the hype is definitely Web3. Yeah, but, but, you know, but, but sure. Yeah, no, but now you're taking us further east <laughs> to Miami. So, uh, you know, look, I, I think, I, I think uh, what is unquestionably the case now, and maybe yeah. it's, it's more obvious the more time you spend yeah. in this world, is this is the fastest growing part of yeah. enterprise software. And if you include cloud infrastructure and cloud infrastructure spend, yeah. You know, it is by many measures 
over uh, five hundred billion dollars and growing, you know, twenty to thirty percent a year. So it, it's a it's a just incredibly well, fast. Let's get, in, part let's of get the into some of the cultural and the the, the shifts that are happening. Because again, when you you have the luxury of being in enterprise when it was hard. It's getting easier and more cooler. I get it and more relevant. <laughs> but there's also the hype of like the Web three, for instance. But you know, for, uh, um, um, the CEO of Snowflake. Okay, has wrote, wrote a book, and Dave Vellante and I were talking about it, and uh, Frank Slootman has says, there's no playbooks. We always ask the CEOs, what's your playbook? And he's like, there's no playbook. Situational awareness always trumps playbooks. So in the enterprise playbook, oh, hire a direct sales force, and SaaS kind of crushed that. Now SaaS is being redefined, right? So what is SaaS? Is Snowflake a SaaS, or is that a platform? So again, new unit economics are emerging, whole new situation, you got Web3, so to me, there's a cultural shift. The young entrepreneurs, the uh, user experience, they look at Facebook and say, ah, you know, they own all my data, and you know, you know that, that cliche, um, they, you know, the product. So as this next gen, the Gen Z and the millennials come in and our customers and the founders, they're looking at things a little bit differently and the tech's better. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we can we can see a lot of commonalities across all successful startups and the overall adoption of technology. Uh, and, and I would tell you, this is all one big giant revolution. I call it the yeah. user-driven revolution, right? It's the rise of the user. Yeah. And you might say product-led growth is currently the hottest trend in enterprise software. It's actually user-led growth, right? Yeah. They're one and the same. So sometimes people think the product uh, is what is so driving the growth. So you just pull the product through. Exactly, exactly. And so that's, that, I, that I think is really this revolution that you see. And it, and it does extend into things like cryptocurrencies and Web3 and you know, sort of like the control that is taken back by the user. Um, but you know, ma many would say that, yeah. that the origins of this movement maybe started with open source yeah. where users were contributors, you know, contributors were users, and looking back decades yeah. and seeing how, how it fast forwards to today, I think that's really the trend that we're all riding. It's enabling these end yeah. users, and these end users in our world yeah. are developers, data engineers, cybersecurity practitioners, right? They're really the users, and they're yeah. really the, the beneficiaries and the most you know, kind of valued people in I this I want to economy. come back to the data engineers in a second, but I want to make a comment and get your reaction to it. I'm a Gen Xer technically, so for not a boomer, but I have some boomer friends who are a little bit older than me who have you know, experienced the 60s. And I've been saying on theCUBE for probably about eight years now that we are going to hit a digital hippie revolution meaning a rebellion against, the 60s was a rebellion against the 50s and the man and you know, summer of love. That was a cultural differentiation from the other one, other group, the predecessors. So we're kind of having that digital moment now where it's like, hey boomers, hey people, we're not going to do that anymore. We hate how you organize shit. Right, but isn't okay. this just technology? I mean, isn't it, isn't it like there used to be the old adage like you, know, you would never get fired for buying IBM, but now it's like you obviously probably would get fired if you bought IBM and I mean it's just like the the, the I think I think well, during the mainframe days those renegades were breaking into Stanford starting the homebrew club so what I'm trying to get at is that do you see the young cultural revolution also culturally like just this is my identity NFTs to me speak volumes about my I want to associate with NFTs not single sign on like well, or, well, yeah. I, absolutely and, and I think like I think you're hitting on something which is like this convergence of of you know, societal trends with technology trends and how that manifests in our yeah. world is, yes, I think like yeah. there is unquestionably almost a religion yeah. around the way in which a product is built, right? Yeah. And we can use open source as one example of that yeah. religion. Some people will say, look, I'll just never try a product in the cloud if it's not open source. Yeah. I think cloud native is another example of that, yeah. right? It, it's either, it's, you know, it, it either is cloud native or it's not. And yeah. I think a lot of people will look at a product and say, look, you know, you were not designed in the cloud era, therefore I just won't try you. And sometimes, um, like it or not, it's a religious decision, right? It's, yeah, some, yeah. it's something that people just believe to be true almost yeah. without uh, necessarily caring about the I mean, the data, the data drives all decision making. Let me ask you this next question. As a VC now, you look at pitch, well, you've been a VC for many years, but you also have the founder uh, entrepreneurial mindset, but you can get, you know, empathize with the founders. You know, hustle is a big part of the, that first founder check, right? You got to convince someone to part with their, their money, and the first money in, which you do a lot of, is about believing in the person. So faking it till you make it, is hard now, you, the data's there. You either have it cloud native, you either have the adaption or traction, so honesty is a big part of that 
pitch. You can't fake oh, it. I, absolutely. You, you know, there used to be this concept of like the persona of an entrepreneur, right? And the persona of the entrepreneur would be, you know, somebody who was a great salesperson or somebody who would tell a great story. And I still think that that's important, right? It still is a yeah. human need for people to believe in narratives and stories. Yeah. But having said that, you're right, the proof is in the pudding, right? At some point, you click download and you try the product and it either does what it says it's going gonna, it's gonna to do or it doesn't, or it either stands up to the load test or it doesn't. And so I, I feel like in this new economy that we live in, really it's a shift from maybe the storytellers yeah. and the creators to, to the builders, right? The people that know how to build yeah, yeah. great product. And in some ways, the people that can build great product yeah. stand out from the crowd and they're the ones that can build communities around their products and you know, in some ways can um, you know, kind of own more of the narrative because their product Speaks for to, exactly the volume. Exactly. And the, back to the user-led growth. Exactly, and it's the religion of I just love your yeah. product, right? Yeah. And I, I, I um, Doug Song, who's the founder of Duo Security, used to say, "Hey, like you know, the the, the really like in today's world of like consumption-based software, like the user is only going to give you 90 seconds to figure out whether or not you're a company that's easy to do business with, right? Yeah. And so you can say and do all the things that you want." about how easy you are to work with, but if the product isn't easy to install, if it's not easy to try, yeah, if it's yeah. not, if the, if the service, you it's know. It's got to the, speak exactly. to the user. Well, let me ask you a question. Now that for the people watching who are maybe entrepreneurial, entrepreneurs, um, master class here is in session, so I have to ask you, do you prefer um, an entrepreneur to come in and say, look at John, here's where I'm at. I have, okay, first of all, storytelling's fine, whether you're an extrovert or introvert, have your style sell the story in a way that's authentic, but do you what do you prefer? to say, here's where I'm at, look, I have an idea, here's my traction, I think, here's my MVP prototype, I need help, or do you want to just see more stats? What's the, what's the preferred way that you like to see entrepreneurs come in and There's engage with There's tons of you? different styles, man. I think the single most important thing that every founder should know is that we, we don't invest in what things are today. We invest in what we think something will become, right? And I think that's yeah. why we all get up in the morning and try yeah. to build something different, right? It's that we see the world a different way, we want it to be a different way, and we want to work every single yeah. moment of the day to try to make that vision a reality. So yeah. I think the more that you can show people where you want to be, the more likely somebody is going to yeah. align with your vision and, and want to invest yeah. in you and want to be along for the ride. So I, I wholeheartedly believe in showing off what you got today because eventually we all get down to like, where are we and what are we going to do together? But um, no, I, you got to show the path. I think the single most important thing for any founder and VC relationship is that they have the same vision. Uh, if you have the same vision, you can, you can get through bumps in the road, you can get through short-term spills, you can, all sorts of things in the middle of the journey can happen. Yeah. But it doesn't matter as much if you share the same long-term vision. If Don't flake yeah. out and, and be fashionable with the, the latest trends, because it, it's over before you even get there. Exactly, I think many people that, that do what we do for a living will say, you know, ultimately the future is relatively easy to predict, but it's the timing that's impossible to predict. So you, <laughs> you, know, you sort of yeah. have to balance the, you know, we, we know that the world is going in this way and therefore we're going to yeah. invest a lot of money to try to make this a reality. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it happens in six months, sometimes it takes six years, sometimes it takes 16 years. Uh, What's the hottest so thing in enterprise that you see the biggest wave that people should pay attention to that you're looking at right now with Decibel Partners, Decibel.vc, your site? What's the big wave? What's your big wave? There, there's three big trends that we invest in and they're the, o they're the only things we do day in, day out. One is the explosion in open source software. So I think many people think that all software is unquestionably moving to an open source model in some form or another. Yeah. Tons of reasons to debate whether or not that is yeah. going to happen and on what timeline. It's been happening forever. But uh, <laughs> it, it, is, it is accelerating <laughs> faster than we've ever seen. So I, I think it's, it's one big massive wave that we continue to ride. Um, second is the rise of data engineering. Uh, I think data engineering is in and of itself now a yeah. category of software. It's not just that we store data, it's now we move data and we develop applications on data and uh, I think data is in and of itself as big of a market as any of the yeah. other markets that we invest in. Uh, and finally, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I've spent my entire career in it. We still feel that security is a market that is underinvested. It is. It continues to be the place where people need to continue to invest and spend more money. Yeah. Uh, and those are the three major trends that we ride. Uh, and security, you think we all need a dessert, do over, right? I mean, do we need a do over in security, or is what's the core problem? I, I, I keep Just, using this word underinvested because I think it's the right way to think about the problem. 
I think if you, I think people, generally speaking, look at cybersecurity as an add-on. Yeah. But if you think about it, the whole economy is moving online, yeah. and so in, in some ways, like security is core to protecting the digital economy, and so it's it shouldn't be an afterthought, right? It should be core to what everyone is doing, and that's why I think relative to the trillions of dollars that are at stake, uh, I believe the market size for cybersecurity is around 150 billion dollars, yeah. and yeah. it still is a fraction of what we're what we're. And protecting. national security even boom, is booming now. So you get the convergence of national security, geopolitics, internet, digital. That's right. Human. I mean, arguably, right? Ar I mean, ar ar argue, arguably, again, it's the area yeah. of the world that people should be spending more yeah. time and more money, yeah. given what's at stake. I love your thesis. I got. I gotta say, you gotta love your firm, love what you're doing. We're big supporters of your mission. Congratulations on your entrepreneurial venture, and uh, we'll be we'll be talking. We'll maybe see you at KubeCon. Uh, Absolutely, certainly man. EU, maybe even North Americans in Detroit this year. Huge fan of what you guys are doing Thanks, here. Thank you so much for having me yeah. on the show. Decibel VC Johnson Duke, here on the Cube. Check him out. Founder for founders here on the Cube. More coverage from San Francisco, California. After this short break, stay with us.